All right, we are now um, going to talk about different types of collisions. So this part should go pretty quick. There are only three different types of collisions. We have totally or completely. Those are just two different words that we use for this. Totally or completely inelastic collisions. And then we have just regular old inelastic collisions. Then we have something special, elastic collisions. Think of it as a spectrum from totally inelastic to inelastic to elastic. So we'll start with totally inelastic. So imagine we have a ball heading towards a wall. It hits and sticks to the wall. All right? So beforehand, it's heading there at 10 meters per second. Afterwards, it hits and sticks to the wall. This is an inelastic collision. This is what an inelastic collision looks like. Um, comes into the wall, hits and sticks to the wall. But we'll look at an example that, that includes some of the momentum stuff that we've been doing. So imagine a, two masses heading towards each other at 10 meters per second. Uh, and let's say that they are two kilograms each. This is the beforehand situation. For a totally inelastic collision, these two objects will hit and stick to each other. Uh, and afterwards, they won't move just for this given set of velocities. So, uh, it's four kilograms because they've hit and stuck together. This is just one example. Uh, they're not always going to stick together and not move. Please don't think that that's the case. It just happens to work out this way for these numbers. Uh, you're going to have to calculate it out every time. Um, just for ease sake, I'm giving it to you here. So, the really important thing that, that tells me if a collision is totally inelastic is that the objects hit and stick together. That's what it takes to be a totally inelastic collision. Nothing special about that. Now, these classifications um, are based on how objects move with respect to the center of mass. So let's calculate that. The velocity of the center of mass is going to be uh, well, afterwards and beforehand, okay, um, 2 times 10 plus 2 times negative 10. Sorry about that mistake. Um, if you do it afterwards, because we know the velocity of the center of mass doesn't change, this is what we have. And if we solve for that, the velocity of center of mass comes out to be 0 meters per second. And we're going to use this same example all the way through. Um, so the velocity of the center of mass is going to be zero meters per second. The big thing about this then is that the objects move with the velocity of center of mass afterwards. When they hit and stick together, they're going to be moving with the velocity of center of mass after the collision. That's what makes a totally or completely inelastic collision. For the just regular inelastic collision. We have the same ball heading towards the wall, moving at 10 meters per second. That's our before situation. And this time, it's going to bounce off the wall, but it's going to bounce off the wall, not with 10 meters per second of velocity, uh, a little bit less than that, 2 meters per second of velocity. That's just how it's going to work. So, no, I said 5 meters per second. All right. Imagine we have two two-kilogram objects heading towards each other at five meters per second this time. Looking at that, the velocity of the center of mass is two times five plus two times negative five. The velocity of the center of mass is still zero in this situation. This time when the objects hit, they're not going to stick together, they're going to bounce apart. And each one's going to bounce off with 2 meters per second of velocity. So, the really kind of, if we're just looking at a collision and we want to know what it is, we could say that in an inelastic collision, the objects hit and separate.
But that also happens with the elastic collision. So that's not a great description. Now, if we remember that the velocity of the center of mass is equal to zero here, we see that we approach the center of mass with 5 meters per second, and we leave the center of mass with 2 meters per second. In this case, then we have lost some velocity with respect to the center of mass. So that's going to be the really big thing that tells me about an inelastic collision. Objects lose some velocity with respect, and that's this WRT, that's with respect to the center of mass. That's what makes it an inelastic collision. They lose some velocity with respect to the center of mass. It approaches the center of mass with 5, leaves the center of mass with 2. In the elastic case, same ball going at 10 meters per second, heading towards the wall. This time, when it hits the wall, it's going to bounce off, and it's going to bounce off with the exact same velocity. In general, that's what all elastic collisions look like. They bounce off and they leave with the exact same velocity. So if we look at two masses heading towards each other uh, with similar speed, this time we are 10 meters per second towards each other. So the first one is... Okay. We'll, we'll walk through the velocity center mass afterwards. This time when they hit, they're just going to bounce off each other and move with the same velocity that they had beforehand. So, again, the objects hit and separate. That's not a good way to distinguish between elastic and inelastic. So we're going to have to look at something else. If we look at the velocity of the center of mass, oops, sorry about all that. Uh, if we look at the velocity of the center of mass for this problem, we see that it's going to be 2 kilograms times 10 meters per second plus 2 t kilograms times negative 10 meters per second divided by 4. That tells me that the velocity of center of mass is zero, just like what we've been looking at. But in this case, they are going with the same speed with respect to the center of mass afterwards. So the way that we're really going to look at this is that objects lose no velocity, none. They keep all of their velocity with respect to the center of mass. That's what makes, that's what makes it elastic. Now, um, I'm going to want to say that one, one more time in a different way. We're going to say each object approaches and leaves the center of mass with the same speed. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about elastic collisions um, in the next video that we do, um, the next time that we get together in class. So that should make more sense as we go on. This is what it means to be elastic. Now, there's one more way that we classify collisions. I don't think it's as helpful as looking at the center of mass. So, um, for that one, anytime we see inelastic for a collision, we're going to say it loses something called kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. You don't have to know what kinetic energy is. You just need to know that anytime we have an inelastic collision, we're going to lose some of our motion energy. And anytime we have an elastic collision, kinetic energy is not lost. That is another way to talk about collisions. Next semester when we come back, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about these different types of energy. Um, don't worry about what that is now. You just need to know that inelastic collisions of any type lose kinetic energy. Elastic collisions do not lose kinetic energy. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is 2D collisions. 2D collisions are not that hard. We just have to remember that in this case, we're going to do conservation of momentum in both the X and the Y directions.
Momentum is conserved in the x direction, and momentum is conserved in the y direction. So when we look at a problem, we're going to split it up into the x and into the y, just like we've done with all of our two-dimensional stuff so far. So imagine we have a 2-kilogram object going at 5 meters per second towards a 3-kilogram object that's at rest. And they're going to hit each other, and our 2-kilogram object is going to go off at an angle. This is the two-dimensional part. It's going to go off with a speed of 2.5 meters per second at an angle of 53 degrees. And what we want is to figure out what our 3-kilogram object is going to do. We don't know the velocity. We don't know the angle. We want both of those things. So for this problem, we're going to look at just our x stuff, and then we're going to look at just our y stuff. So in the x direction, m1, v1 in the x initially, plus m2, v2 in the x, is going to be equal to m1, v1 prime in the x direction, plus m2, v2 prime in the x direction. So... What that means for us, looking at everything, initially, everything's moving in the x direction, so we don't have to break that up. But afterwards, we're moving at an angle. So we're going to have to take that 2.5 meters per second at 53 degrees and look at the x and y components of that velocity. Well, we've done this a lot before. So in the x direction, it's 2.5 meters per second times the cosine of 53, plug that in, it comes out to be 1.5 meters per second. In the y direction, it's 2.5 meters per second times the sine of 53, that comes out to be 2 meters per second. So for this final velocity for object 1, 1.5 meters per second is in the x, 2 meters per second is in the y. So when we're looking at our x direction, let's plug in everything. So 2 kilograms, and all of that 5 meters per second happens to be in the x direction. So I don't have to break it up at all. Plus well, 3 kilograms times 0. No surprises there. Plus 2 kilograms times the x component, which is 1.5 meters per second. Plus mass 2, which is 3 kilograms, and we don't know the x part of v2. That's what we're going to find with this x part. So, uh, 10 plus 0 is equal to 3 plus 3 v2 in the x final. So, 7 thirds is v2 in the x final, which is 2.33 meters per second. So, we are now halfway done with figuring it out. We need to jump over and figure out what the y component of our final velocity is. So in the y direction, same thing, but we're just looking at the y components this time. We've already broken everything up, so now it's just a matter of plugging things in. Looking at all our y components. So the 2 kilogram object initially is traveling just in the x direction, so it doesn't have any y velocity to begin with. So it's 0. Plus 3 kilograms times 0. I jumped ahead there. You have 2 kilograms times, and we already broke this up, 2 meters per second, plus 3 kilograms times velocity 2 in the y direction. That's what we're going to find. So 0 is equal to 4 plus 3v2. Subtract that 4 over, we get negative 4 over 3 is equal to the y part of my final velocity for object 2. Comes out to be 0.75. Now, this does not tell me the, the total velocity. I now just have my x parts and my y parts. So we need to make a little triangle. The x component of that triangle is 2.33 meters per second. The y part of that triangle is negative 0.75. That means it's going down, which matches our picture. So if we do the Pythagorean theorem, V2 prime comes out to be 2.45 meters per second. And we need the angle, so we're going to use our trig stuff. So if it's this angle up here at the top, we have both opposite and adjacent sides, so we're going to use tangent. So the tangent of that angle is equal to 0.75, my opposite side, divided by 2.33. That gives me an angle 
of 17.8 degrees. So the velocity of the object afterwards is 2.45 meters per second at 17.8 degrees, and it looks like below the horizontal, which kind of matches our picture. So this breaking momentum up into the X and into the Y is exactly what we're going to do during lab tomorrow. Be ready to go on that.